everyone. Welcome to another episode of West Station Station. This week we are looking at, or this episode we are looking at, This Week in Rust, 441. Uh, my name is Tim McNamara and I'm here with Alan Weimar, who takes the interviews. Alan, what did you think about this week just in general? My personal week or this week in Rust? <laughs> yeah, and this week in Rust. Yeah, yeah. Like um, you get, you're more than welcome to chat about your own your own life and how it interrelates if you want. No, I think this week is pretty solid. Um I feel like maybe a little bit less uh in terms of like the general um Rust kind of internal stuff, right? Like I think last last episode there was quite a few updates across and people kind of discussing the future, et cetera, of Rust, like official updates is what I mean. This week, yeah, less. Yeah. Uh, but definitely don't make, don't take that as something that's less exciting, right? There's still stuff exciting going on. Totally. Totally. Um, so um, mm -hmm. we've been playing around, well, we've been trying this new, uh, we've been thinking, Al and I have been thinking about, oh, and also our co host, Sean, have been thinking about the format a little bit. And we decided to try something slightly different. So let us know if this works for you or not. Uh, and we thought we'd sort of pick our top three posts in the newsletter and kind of flesh them out uh, rather than going through every single thing in depth. Yep. So we basically thunderdome this out, right? And that's maybe why Sean couldn't arrive. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we chose each of us chose three different topics, so there's no overlap. So just want to make that part clear. And I thought the other format change that I'll make is I I feel like reading out the quote of the week at the start might is to kind of as a as a as a nice way to go into it. And we've got a quote from Amos, uh, otherwise known as Faster Than Lime. Ah, but logic errors can happen with all languages. Yes, I'm sure trains occasionally run into trees as well, but K cars are way more likely to. So Amos is just having a bit of a dig at uh, basically every other programming language except Rust. Not quite, not quite. Well, that's not entirely fair. But uh, actually, one of Alan's uh, posts uh, that he'll be discussing uh, about bugs that the compiler will find for you um, ties into this idea quite nicely that Rust is actually really good on uh, the safety side. So, um. Actually, Alan, do you want to start? We can like bounce off one after another. Which is the first post that you'd like to chat about? Um, well, in particular, um, the first one I reviewed is about the uh, async Rust and the working group. What's going on? Uh, it's kind of funny because just before I reviewed this video, I actually just recorded an episode with one of the team leads of that one. I think it actually is the team lead. Uh, and so I got already a deep dive. So you can check out the episode coming up soon. And um, Anyways, this is kind of great that these guys did a video. So I believe it was Cameron who came out and uh, was talking about what the working group is actually doing and explaining who they are, what they're doing, and, and what's the progress. And um, it's great. So let me just give like a quick wrap up from the video. The video is not too long, about 20, 30 minutes, I think. Uh, but anyways, the working group is put together to solve issues across the runtime. So one of the biggest complaints, I think, uh, about async Rust is the fact about the runtime. So this would be like async standard, I think it's called. Um, to Tokyo. Tokyo. Sorry, Tokyo. It's not Tokyo. I keep wanting to say that for some reason. Even though I know it's Tokyo. <laughs> and, so Tokyo. And, and small, right? It's the, the yeah, least... small, yeah. So what I like about the beginning of the video is like he kind of approached this as, okay, I'm a beginner to Rust. And what do I do, right? I just want to run async code, right? And what is small? What is all this stuff? Why do I need this? Why do I need that? And I think that's a really great way to, to do this. Um, and they're talking about basically two types of ways that uh, async Rust can be done, which is uh, something called readiness, which is done with ePoll, where the OS will return immediately and tell the program, um, and, and it tells the program later on that it's ready, right? So you kind of give it something. Um, and the kind of the nice part is that you don't need to allocate memory for that. You kind of just wait until the, until the computer says it's ready, then you give it the allocation. Um, it's good for a web server because you don't need to pre-allocate a bunch of memory. You could just kind of do it on the fly. Uh, another one that's getting quite popular these days is, is actually the completion method using IO ring, and I think it's been talked about quite a bit recently. Uh, now, the bad part is that you have to allocate the memory sooner, right? So if you have a lot of traffic, maybe this could eat up your, your, your memory on your computer. Uh, um, see, I hadn't really got that. 
before. I thought it was just kind of like yeah. you get like a magical wand that just goes faster. But actually, you no, know, there's definitely a trade off. Well, that's what the point is, there, right? They're talking about the trade offs, right? And I think that's kind of also down to, you know, how everything is done. Um, and then they're talking about, you know, how they want to be able to solve this. And, um, you know, one way they're going to solve it is, uh, what is it? Is that um, if you ever, so one problem that happens, right, is if you do the IO ring part. I'm sorry, which one is it? Yeah, it should be IO ring. Where you allocate memory. You actually, have, you actually should, should be giving the ownership to that, to the OS. Because what could happen is maybe you say, okay, I want to do this thing. And then you want to cancel that future. Now, what do you do? Because you have this memory, and then you could have an unsafe problem, right? Um, interesting. So I think they're looking at doing something like uh, transferring ownership of the buffer to the OS, and then let the OS kind of cancel and deallocate, etc. Uh, anyways, so anyways, the main point of that is that the team is working on ways to make uh, you know everything more standard. So if you just want to swap out your runtime, you can do that. Um, that was basically the main ideas and also a couple other things too that APIs are working on. Um, you may not know they're working on stuff. I mean, but they are, and it takes a long time because they have to talk to every single runtime and see what they're doing and propose stuff that should work for all. And it takes a while to do that. Yeah, I suppose the name working group is a lot nicer than like talking group, but it probably feels like they are talking groups more than they well, are working groups, right? Well, to or, hear more about the process, uh, when I interviewed, um, uh, what's his name? Sorry, it's drawn my, it's quite early for me over here, even though it's 9.30. But anyways, it's <laughs> look, it's 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 early somewhere. Uh, yeah. You so know, and Tyler, so Tyler Mandry, I believe his name is. Um, he did discuss about the process and what they're doing, etc. So if you want some more information about that, you can hear hear about that in the episode. Oh, that's really cool, Alan. I mean, I I also appreciate that Nick Cameron came in and gave like a public public talk to kind of lift the hood a little bit. Um, I was going to talk about a new experimental language feature, uh, and, but I'll postpone that till next. I want to chat about the other talk from that uh, from that event. So the uh, the event was Rust Lintz and Rust, uh, so based in Austria, and they have been doing remote meetup uh, talks for basically since the start of the pandemic. And the they had two talks that night, and the other was called Rust for the Kubernetes Ecosystem. This is a talk about Rust and Kates, which is historically an area where Go has really dominated. Kubernetes itself is written in Go. Lots of the tooling around it is written in Go. And here is a sort of a project talk about um, about someone's experience of writing some integrations and this uh, actually an in-terminal uh, dashboard for Kubernetes in Rust. I uh, actually was surprised that there wasn't a lot of focus on the appropriateness for Rust uh, in like the, the cloud native world. I was kind of expecting more along the lines of Rust is great because it doesn't have a runtime, so you can stick it wherever you need it to be. It's really low resources. Uh, so it doesn't take many resources and so forth. But instead, it was kind of just a, it was an introduction or someone's personal views about why they chose Rust. And then a little bit of a tour of some of the other tools that people have built. And that, uh, uh, so I've, I, I kind of went in there hoping for something that was a little bit deeper, but actually, um, what, uh, was provided is probably quite useful for anyone who is just kind of looking for like a, a bit of an overview or especially if you're relatively new to Rust. Yeah. I mean, it actually, one of the, the cool parts that I think I want to mention is that the guy started off saying, I'm not a Rust guy. Um, a Java guy, which is, I think they kind of battle each other, to be honest. Uh, it's, you know, garbage versus non-garbage. Um, garbage language versus non-garbage language, right? Uh, I think you kind of <laughs> just put your mouth in it there. <laughs> like, no. no I, yeah. 
I think I think it's good to talk about that, right? And and you know why not use Java, right? Maybe there's a reason for that. I think he kind of addressed some of that, but I think it was actually kind of cool that he was like, "Listen, why am I doing this?" And and he compared it to K9s, which is a very very popular tool written in Go. And um, so his is K dash, right? I don't remember. If, I don't think you said the name K dash. Maybe I didn't hear it. But K dash. No, is a tool no, I lift off, lift off the name. Um, yeah, I was oh, scrambling so- around in my notes trying to find it. Yeah, K dash. Uh, so you can actually brew install K dash on your in your Mac, or you know, there's ways to to download it. Um, but it's basically, I think you said it's actually more featured than K nine S, which is interesting. Um, so I love it. I love the idea. I love that we can use Rust for this stuff, and um, we need more applications like this. I like the style of that. Is it called TUI T U I or something? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to know whether or not it's TUI or T U I. Probably TUI because people say gooey. Uh, but whenever I think of Tui, I think of the bird, which is a, a, <laughs> which is a, as a, yeah, which is a New Zealand bird that uh, isn't as famous as the kiwi, let's say. Okay. Um, they're quite pretty, and they, they have a really lovely song. But uh, So that's what I think of when I hear the, hear the word Tui. But um, I guess New Zealand English is not universal. I think it's probably the least universal out of all the English I've ever heard. I know more Australian than I do New Zealand words. <laughs> okay, Alan, uh, hit me up with your number two. So my number two is um, bugs that Rust compiler catches for you. This, uh, this guy, Sylvan, he's been having some pretty interesting articles for the last few weeks. Um, and I assume it's was... because he's finished his book. Which is black hat rust, right? And he's like yeah, exactly, trying to yeah. stir up some interest by, but no, I, I agree. Uh, he had, he did the article last week about the hair, last episode about the hair, so that's quite interesting. Uh, and this one, um, I think he mostly to me was kind of like a rehash of things, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because people sometimes forget the benefits you get with rust. And um, I don't know if he meant to do this or not, but he basically said you should be using rust and. Here's Go code, and this is why all this Go code is bad. Which I mean, <laughs> I have done that bit... in a talk by, by accident. Really, I was just like, yeah. "Oh, here is some perfectly reasonable Go code. Like, spot the bug." And for me, it was like you can send a map down a channel, and if you've used Go before, that makes sense. Uh, and then, so you can send a value down a channel in Rust terminology. You'd be giving the ownership to the receiver. Uh, but you can mutate the map from the sending side, even if you've kind of sent it through. Uh, and so if you kind of, in Rust terminology, you would have sort of t- dual owners, which is a bit of a problem, uh, or you'd have kind of shared aliasing. Uh, and uh, Go doesn't care. <laughs> Maybe it does now, uh, but that's interesting that, that you picked up on that one too. Yeah, um, I yeah, but I think this is kind of a refresher, like I said, about you know, hey, this is what Rust kind of gives you out the box, and this is the benefits of it. And I think it's kind of nice to have, uh, kind of reminds you of certain things because sometimes it's like out of sight, out of mind. And the bar checker does a lot for you, and I think that's nice to have a rehash about. Oh, okay, this is actually good. I'm using this language, and I think Go is still way popular and way easier for people to get started. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh, you have to weigh weigh the benefits, right? And as far as like, yeah, Go is a popular reason for a language. I mean, is a popular language for a reason is what I was trying to say. And the reason is that it's simple and it's very easy to get stuff done. Like it doesn't have a lot of bureaucracy, whereas I think Rust is quite bureaucratic uh, and quite picky a lot of the time and like finicky around syntax uh, in ways that I find irritating. But um, yeah. Oh, don't yeah, worry, yeah. We'll, we'll get to some guy who has got similar opinions with as you pretty soon. I, I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, so the... Moving on, touching on what the compiler can do from you, let's talk about expanding the compiler and seeing about what uh, the, the developers of Rust-C are doing for us. There is a really interesting PR that has been merged this week. It is entitled Add do yeet expressions to allow experimentation in nightly and they've added a keyword yeet that's y e e t uh kind of this like slam t- slang term just to kind of 
put something in nightly that they're never going to use in standard rust just to kind of play around with a new way of doing uh a new a, a new way of kind of working with error handling they wanted to give themselves the space for uh for experimentation but didn't want to get stuck on having to decide on a name yet um so i just really like that the rust the rust developers are um are giving themselves this kind of freedom and it's interesting as someone who's more of an observer to the rust project in the sense of like the rust compiler uh to kind of observe how it works and i think this is a really nice way to um to see it in action so the rfc itself is related to try to find out more uh, uh, try to kind of expand the use of the question mark operator um because they require some type information which may or may not be necessary the compiler developers are not sure um yeah do you have any how 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 would i do there in explaining or fleshing things out for you i didn't i tried my best i really actually looked at this one because when we discussed i wanted to also be up to date about these things i didn't quite understand what's the point of this maybe maybe i missed something um First of all, the word yeet, I think I hear it, but I don't still don't quite understand it. Like yeet. Yeah, is... I don't I don't have any idea what this means. This is not in my like social vernacular. I'm clearly not cool enough for the rust. I think it's like you just it's I it's kind of like I'm just gonna do it and just hope. I, I assume it means that I don't care. That's what I get. Yeah. From it. it sounds like a way to help with easier experimentation, and I'm kind of okay with that. I, I don't know. I still like feel like it's maybe it's not so clear. The fact now I don't feel so bad. Before I felt bad. I read it and I was like, I don't understand this. And then you offered to take this one. I was like, well, I think Tim can understand it. And then you're like, mm, I don't totally understand this. Now I I feel not so much like a dummy anymore. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> well, I can read out from the RFC, which is explains um, explains what's what's trying what they what they're attempting is that the. Uh, the problem is that the try trait, that is the trait that enables um, the tr uh, the kind of the question mark operator, is um, has some limitations that they want to avoid. But this yeet keyword tries to avoid the problems that including something like throw or raise would bring, which is something that would occur if you looked at it from like a java lens or a python for example and you wanted to throw an exception or sort of raise an exception for example um they didn't want to have that cat fight uh before they had actually seen whether or not the feature could be implemented the way that they want um that is the the feature they they just want to be able to enable more expressions to be kind of exp uh, evaluated and then being able to kind of catch and return uh, you know almost like expressions but not quite oh sorry not expressions almost like exceptions but not quite so you kind of get something that looks and feels a bit like a result but isn't um and i think uh but i didn't actually attempt to understand the internals of the compiler <laughs> sadly okay. i'm not there i'm not well i, I feel like i'm close-ish but not um but not but not all the way there okay, okay alan you got you got your last um you've got your last blog post yeah my last pick it's written by some guy named bim or joe or something some random, just yeah. Some random. Some no, it's, some 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 no name. Yeah, some guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Doesn't even understand yeet. But uh, anyway, sorry. It, just to be straight, it's written by Tim. Um, I think uh, Sean thought it wouldn't be necessary for you to talk about your own blog post, but I think it's good to hear. You know, if I get some misunderstandings, but I think you bring up um, stuff that is definitely questioned. Right, kind of going back to the working group. Okay, I'm a beginner to Rust. What's a runtime? Why do I need it? Why do I have to add this in? And you didn't talk about this one in particular, but you did bring up similar realm situations, right? 
for instance, you talked about um, should I use a hash map versus a B tree map? I didn't even know we had a B tree map. I'm aware of hash map. I've used that one, but not the B tree map. So I learned something new. Uh, and then I started questioning myself. Oh, did I use the wrong one? <laughs> the, 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 so the, yeah, in that case, and I don't want to kind of like derail your thoughts completely, but the objective of that section of that post is to say whenever, or in fact, the whole post really, is whenever you introduce a decision point, you introduce kind of a cognitive burden on the programmer. So we can provide defaults, say, and options. Well, so, uh, and if we provide sensible defaults, we'll actually make things easier for beginner programmers because then they can actually take the time to understand the syntax and understand Rust before being able to have to make decisions around details like, which type of map should I use? And in that case, the a B tree map is almost never what you want to use, unless you want to go through. Unless there's some sort, a hash map in some sense, you could think of all the values are equally spaced apart. But in a B tree map, there's an ordering, and it enables you to ask for like the uh, all items that are between two two values, or like so between nine and twelve. If you had integer keys, let's say, much more easily than a hash map, because a hash map to provide that kind of functionality would need to go and apply its hash function, like the comparison against uh, the that range for every single value, because there's no ordering internally. The it's yeah by definition you have this kind of scattering across the um the the space if you understand how hash maps are implemented. And there are some other points in which I think Rust, uh, by the way, you know, uh, sorry, I'll finish my sentence. There are some other points in which Rust introduces complexity that I think can be uh, made less complex. I, I don't know if I've got solutions for all of this. This is basically saying I was trying to kind of be provocative and say, is this a problem that other people feel? You know, did you have, and I wanted to kind of flesh out whether or not uh, anyone in the Rust community thought, actually, Rust was really annoying at some given point because I wasn't sure what to do. And I needed, and I didn't have the information to make the choice. Like, which string type do I use? Or uh, how do I convert back to... Uh, String slice, say, and like, why am I using as ref in some places, and why am I using to string in some other places, or you know, or which trait bounds do I need to use when I'm dealing with strings? I could use as ref uh, stir, which means if you call as ref on me, I get back a string slice, or I could have the to string. Uh, trait bound which is or even you could do something like display or debug um, could also be used in sort of like a proxy way for seeing whether or not this value can be used as a string uh, i don't know if any of it really um so the idea was just like what else can we do to get rid of this perception that rust is really hard to learn because as long as we have that perception, the Rust community is never really going to become, I'd say, anyone's first choice. Uh, that's not quite true. There are people that are kind of like, they believe. But we're, we're running out of people who are convinced by Rust and find the safety story or the compiler checks very compelling. But we have the rest of the 99% of the software industry and all the rest of the programmers to come. They need to make a decision. And if the decision is between something that's easy and something that's hard, or even something that is like easy and slightly harder, they'll probably go for the thing that is slightly harder. I don't want us to feel like Rust is the perfect programming language, or it doesn't necessarily need to be a universal one. But I want it to feel, I, I want it to be sort of as good as it can be. I want it to kind of be its best self. And I think that there's no requirement to be 
hard, like being complicated or difficult um, isn't something we should be necessarily proud of. I think um, I kind of wanted to move this forward. I think you got a good uh, part with this. But what I, I want to say, uh, actually, is um, I, let you, I think you guys should read it yourself and kind of get your own ideas um, because it's got some pretty good arguments. But I think what, what I derived from your article uh, in terms of I agree with everything you said, but what I also derived from here is actually um, some of the things you're pointing out are actually comes from some of the benefits, right? So if we talk, one of the things you talk about is cargo, REST-C, Clippy, or REST-FMT. The, I mean, the correct thing to do is single tool, single use case, right? The unix way. Do one thing and do it well. But then you can also say, well, why do I have, you know, all these things? Well, I, I mean, you can't have one without the other, right? And I think there's, but I understand your side, right? Maybe, maybe one interface to use these things underneath is probably the better way to, 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 maybe, yeah, to look, maybe solve this one. I, I, I think the, the only, so my, my take comes from a very strange point, which is that I'm writing books and stuff, right? So I've actually, I've written Rust in Action, but I've got, I've got a couple of other projects that are, kind of, that are kind of bubbling along. And one of the things that's really annoying is to give uh, code examples that people can't just copy and paste and run because they might require a, like some external crate. And there's no way to specify crates with inside a single code listing. I need to have two code listings and say, well, this is your cargo.toml file and that needs to be laid out in a particular way. And I know that's a really weird code uh, thing, but you know, people submit bug reports. But if you submit a bug report with a uh, with any and your rep, um, your code that reproduces the error requires a, an external dependency, well, then you're kind of in a similar problem. You can't just send a single file that is the bug. Um, you can't have like a minimum reproducible thing that's simple and compact. It's all just a bit complicated. And my sense is that the, we've got Rust format. Well, actually, the big one is between Cargo and Rust. Uh, Rust up. Like, if you are just if you're on the first day of Rust, it's difficult to understand why Rust up exists as an independent tool, given that everything else seems to be centered around Cargo. Um, and what I I'm not actually proposing. Well, I think I do in that case. I say, well, look, it should all just be in a single executable or a single wrapper called Rust. And I think, you know, you could do that in various ways. I'll probably start out with... Uh, but the... But it's, it's, it, it, it comes from... A, you know, you can disagree with my, with, with, with my analysis, but it comes from a nice place, which is that I really want to... Don't bite the newbies. I really don't want us to bite the newbies. No, I understand. Um, but I, I just want to kind of provide devil's advocate for some of these sides, right? Uh, another good one is, um, I mean, the make the cargo script one, I'm open-minded about that. I just feel like you're, now you're, you're making a different language, right? This language has to be compiled. That's kind of my feedback on that one, but I'm, I'm open about that one. We've already discussed string and string slice. That's been overdone, but there's a lot more than just that, like the asref. That, that was a little bit new one to me, but I understand. The age-old question, which, how big should my int or my float be? Yeah, that's a huge issue. And I understand that one is very difficult to talk about. Um, but I think uh, one more like really good one that you brought up, which was like, and I think this is a problem of, a problem derived from the benefit of the community, which is like, we have Rust up, we got Rustling's course you mentioned, and some books on Rustling. It does seem like there's no clear organization for some of these things. And I think that kind of relates back to the way Rust works is like, okay, we have all these working groups and they organize themselves. And some people are on Zoop, some people are not. And you do yeah. whatever works best. And so you're going to get disorganization. There's no BDFL, right? So how do you manage and, stuff and from the top the, down? The, the other thing is, is Rust is really big now. Like the Rust community is large. Um, there isn't a, yeah, like or it doesn't even need to be a BDFL. But like one single sponsor, like a Java Foundation, or you know, like Oracle in, in the sense of the Java world, or the Python Software Foundation, you kind of have this kind of 
we've got the Rust Foundation, but I feel like the Rust Foundation is deliberately adjacent to the language of the development itself. It's kind of more there in support of everything else <laughs> that and like it just and, and and to allow the language itself to kind of grow without being um strangled by corporate overlords so there's kind of this reluctance to uh consolidate because uh, the problem with consolidation is that someone needs to get hurt feelings really um oh it's just also really complicated to get people to agree um no one is going to um give up their favorite thing now we can so we've hit 30 minutes now we've got a decision to make and that is do we call it for time or do we go with um the last one i guess the third way to go would just be do a quick quick um overview yeah let's do the quick overview i don't want you to all that wasted effort <laughs> right so the last post that i wanted to chat about was c plus plus and rust generics and specialization this is a blog post from a company called tango and vision uh written by jeremy stewart now this is a really interesting deep dive into Rust and C++ uh, about a company that has decided to kind of go deep or kind of like back Rust and trying to explain some of the differences between uh, generic code and the C++ world and how that kind of maps across and where there's friction because they there is a distinct uh, a distinct there is a difference between templates and traits uh and what i actually found that a really really nice blog post from the point of view that it explains traits very well and that uh and and what kind of what their role is that they can create uh they can be used of these kind of interface types and you can have uh, a trait can kind of group multiple types together in kind of some sort of super trait uh, sort of super type without needing to uh, include like inheritance for example and uh yeah yeah i think the big thing that i got out of it really because i am not as familiar i'm actually unfamiliar with c++ but the big thing that i got out of it was that there are still there's still some room for improvement on the rust side that some of the things that you can do in terms of zero size types so and implementing or creating traits with what like no methods um like market tra traits for example kind of seems a bit clunky or uh might be uh it kind of seems like a slightly uh, like a bit of a side thought. Now you can't change too much of Rust without changing, like without creating a new language. That problem that you just mentioned. Um, and I don't think that Rust needs to, in some instances, be the perfect programming language. But um, I thought it was cool. Okay. We did no. say we're going to make this quick, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I don't think I read this article. I think maybe I skimmed it, but it can, we're recording this one a little bit late. I, I don't remember uh, too much about that article. No, no, no. That's all good. Um, yeah. So the big thing is that we we talk about um, the the main example is like creating a function that wants to um, uh, creating a function that kind of deals with pixel and different color um different what are they called we've got images and they all have like different formats for being able to represent pixels uh and we want to be able to have multiplication over different integer types for example um and yeah no 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 so that um that was the third thing that i thought was 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 quite neat that we had this really thorough and very um yeah a very very thorough post that was a really nice discussion of like rust and c++ as friends in the in the space cool well i think that just about wraps up uh this episode of rust station station this week in rust 441 please let us know if you love like 
or dislike even uh, the new format. We're really interested in continuing to iterate and improve. Um, yeah, thank you so much and hope that you've enjoyed the week. Bye-bye.